So friends, today we are catching up with Johannes Meyer and his son Jason. And there's a reason we're standing on this somewhat rustic um, dock leading out into a pond. Um, that's because we're here to talk about water today and what it does in our landscape. And Johannes has been farming here at Danthonia for what, the better part of two decades. And Jason, yeah. you've grown up here on the farm and have been at your dad's side through all of that. So a lot of um, shared learning there. So what can you guys tell me about water that I don't already know and why is it so integral to everything we've been doing here on our farm? Where would you start? I think I would start by saying that photosynthesis is an incredibly important part of the life cycle on Earth. And for photosynthesis to take place, you need water. You need sunlight. And with those two, you can produce plant life, abundant plant life. Where I grew up, water was never an issue. And moving to Australia, uh, we quickly realized that water is precious. Water does not always come every year and one's whole mindset has to change. When we arrived here, I remember when the rains fell on the water would just run off in sheets off the all these hills off the here, landscape, off yeah. the landscape. It would take the topsoil, it would break dams, and we were just like, wow, look at all the water, but then it would just disappear. Right, and look at this dam here, right? Yeah. Full of water, we hear birds, we hear frogs, we hear you know, life around us. Two years ago, this dam was empty. Mm -hmm. All the fish died. Uh, at the end of one of the worst droughts that we've seen in our time in Australia. And now it's sobering and, uh, you know, really enforced this message of the preciousness of water. And so you got to think, like, how can we hold on to this precious thing that falls from the sky at, you know, at times that we don't plan, um, sometimes really, really abundantly, in fact, too much, other times it doesn't rain at all and then you start to appreciate and through the you know through contact with many Australian farmers who have wrestled with this problem for many more years than I have began to understand some of the ways that we can actually hold water in the landscape even in dry times. Well I grew up in England where we would go out and clear the ditches and create drains to move the water on through but yeah. what, what you're telling me sounds like really the opposite so, Jay, is that right? I mean, really what we're trying to do here on the farm is keep our water as long as we can. Yeah, it's about water retention, and we've done that in multiple ways. Obviously, this dam is one example. We've built banks to hold water when it falls, um, also to divert water to where it's needed around the property, mm -hmm. rather than trying to get it off the fields and into the rivers. So, I mean, we've been on a, on a path say we collectively here at the D'Antonio Bruderhof, but certainly you brothers who put in the time and the hard yards on it to bring our property um, to a much more healthy and holistic place. What of the things that relate to water have we tried or are we implementing that's different from traditional farming practices or that, that would be you know, going back to maybe a way that things used to be done but have been forgotten? What would you say to somebody who's, who's looking for ways that they can perhaps take a fresh look at, at, at their landscape and say, you know, what could I be doing differently today mm -hmm. to retain that water? So I'd like you to think about a sponge, right? And if you put a sponge on your kitchen table and pour water on it, watch the water absorb into that and, and, and hold there. Yes, it may slowly dribble out the bottom, water's always moving, but it's held there. And really, I would say the most important thing about holding water in the landscape is to create a sponge in the soil. How is that done? The, the sponge is, is humus, is a fertile living soil loaded with biology and with soil carbon. That's what holds water in the landscape primarily. And um, that's achieved through a, ver a variety of different tools, um, one of which is managed grazing, um, one of which is supporting and increasing soil biology, and another one is uh, increasing the diversity of the plants. And if you really think about this, what we're trying to do is mimic nature. This is not new ideas. This is stuff that goes back millennia and that people used to understand broadly in societies that uh, existed hundreds of years ago. But now we've lost that to a great extent and we need to rediscover 
how to work with nature and to look at the functions that existed in decades and centuries gone past and to appreciate that and then find ways to uh, let that happen on our landscapes um, across the world today. And I have to flag here a very good friend of mine, uh, Peter Andrews, who imparted much of the knowledge uh, that we've been able to um, understand around water in the landscape. And he learned much of this from the uh, Aboriginal uh, people he spent much of his childhood with. And it's just interesting to see that connection back in history uh, to a time when understanding was of these systems was, was there. Well, I think we've lost the ability to read the landscape. And I know of a couple people that can read it, they can look at the land, they can see where the water flows in the, in the ground and use that uh, to their advantage in terms of increasing productivity, increasing drought tolerance, etc. And I think that's the main ability which modern farming or modern agriculture has lost. We've tried to address that in a number of ways, try and hold that water in our landscape. One of those methods is to use level contour banks so it holds the water rather than running it off the field. So um, you're, you're physically going out there and surveying the landscape, shooting levels like that, is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah, we are doing that. We're also just turning it various intervals just to make little pools along the way. And that's what was lacking when we first came here. It yeah. resulted in the water pouring down. Correct? Yeah, it would, just, it would just run off the fields and make gullies on the edges of the fields. We want to take a look too at our, at our creek because uh, it's one of the most beautiful features of our property. But Johannes, could you describe briefly the changes that we've seen over the years in that creek? Before I tell you how the creek looked, you know, 20 years ago, it would probably be good just to touch briefly on what it would have looked like 200 years ago prior to white settlement. Mm. And I think another example of how the Australian continent, which is cycles dry and wet frequently, very dry and then very wet, um, there were functions in the landscape that protected it from the damage that can be caused by either drought or flood. And uh, those functions included in the floodplains or in the riparian zones, the, the rivers and streams, would be reed beds and plants growing in the water that would slow the water's progression downstream and, and it reduce erosion. If you would find a river in Australia two, three hundred years ago, it wouldn't be a broad river as we know it in America with water flowing down. You'd, you'd see the riffles of water, but then there'd be a broad, vast reed bed, maybe kilometers or miles across. And then that would meander down might be another riffle of water and then another big reed bed. So the terminology that we use to explain that is called chain of ponds. So instead mm -hmm. of having an actual flowing body of water, which Australia you know, really doesn't have that much water to, to flow, is rather water that's held in these systems and moves slowly. And um, as conventional farming took over and as the soil was able to hold less and less water right from the hilltops down to the valleys, more and more water would come at a faster and faster rate and did cause enormous erosion through our creek valley and across Australia. So we do have an, a very eroded creek system. What's the impact of that erosion on your water table in the valley? Then? Right. And, and that's a good question, Chris, because <clears throat> back in the day when the system was intact, water would uh, the water level was a lot higher in the valley and it would spread out across the floodplain and you'd have an enormous underwater lake holding water that would actually take you through the dry times. That's that sponge you were talking it's about. the sponge, right. Yeah, okay. And that function is now missing in our landscape. Mm -hmm. And we're in, in a very slow process of trying to reinstate that, but it, we're talking, you know, decades to uh, restore that, that sort of a, a life system. Uh, so, but we have made a sl slow progress. Um, to be honest, when we got here, Swan Brook was still a pretty active cod stream. We could catch good fish in there. And even in the period that we've been here in the last 20 years, we've seen degradation before we saw improvement in the last couple of years. But over time, plants have grown in the, in the creek again because we've fenced livestock out. And slowly that system is coming back into life. You know, the water is being slowed down as it flows through. 
that deposit silt raises the stream bed, spreads the water in the floodplain. You know, we're encouraging the growth of reeds and, um, and shrubs and uh, water plants. And all those things are, are, are having a slow effect. But it took many years to be destroyed as it was, and it'll take many to get it back. Uh, but we're, we're consistently working in that direction. So we arrived here on the back of a millennial drought, then we hit another one in 2007 to 2009, but 2007 is when we started the Regen Ag seriously, right? right. Um, and I'm just wondering how did our land handle the drought um, that hit in 2019 and 2018, hung around for a good two years. How did our land respond to that, that drought? Going into the drought, um, we actually had abundant feed. Uh, and coming out of it, we managed to hold on to all the cattle that we started out with. And that's a function of a number of things, but water in the landscape was a big one of those. I guess our, our land handled it very well looking back. Obviously, when you th see things drying up and the grass is, loses value, uh, it's definitely not a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, and we thought you know, if it, if it kept going on for much longer, we'd lose our cattle. But, you know, I guess due to the regenerative management practices we've been doing for the last 10, 15 years, it, it really paid off in that drought. Um, what projects did you undertake during the dry time that you thought might be advantageous for when the rains did come? Yeah, well, we did a, a massive project in our main valley, um, just below where we're standing and that involved digging a number of, of dams um, where we knew they'd fill from either springs or just runoff and also building a number of, of these large contour banks which we mentioned before um, as a function to catch water coming out of the different valleys on our property and to funnel it back up into this one at the top of this valley. You know, digging that in a dry time, it's, it's interesting because you're not working with water, you're just playing with levels and large machinery. And you don't really have any idea what it'll look like when it's full of water. And you just kind of trust that the rain will eventually come. And it did, and it's, it's actually been really exciting because we've got a number of different things going on in a flood. We've got the water in the creek, which is always very brown. And we've got the water coming into our property. And as it flows through our property, through our valleys, it cleans up and when it hits that creek it's it's clear it's really all the plants that are throughout the system the, the reeds especially and slowing the water down when it when it picks up pace it picks up dirt picks up trash and as soon as you slow it down it drops it all again so abundant diverse plant life how do you keep the energy going at the regen ag practices during times of drought when you're not seeing the water and like you said we're playing with levels and yeah i guess that's where you just have to you just have to know that the rain will come you know at the end of every bad time is a is a good time and vice versa yeah and you think in australia you don't think in cycles of years you think in you know maybe 5 to 10 year cycles yep. and that's part of part of life here i love talking to you guys cuz it always comes back to that humility that we need to have to know that we're just um, a small part of a much bigger uh, a, a bigger theater that's playing out all, all around us. We, we get to be, you know, play a little role in that and, yeah. um, and to try to learn what, what many generations before us probably knew intuitively hmm. um, and rediscover that and re-implement it is a beautiful thing. Friends, we're going to be talking more with Johannes and Jason, hopefully over the coming weeks and months, to uh, learn more about our landscape and the different things we're doing here on the farm. Thank you both for what, what, you, what you've taught us today, and uh, we'll look forward to furthering the conversation soon. Absolutely. It was a pleasure. Thanks. It's an epic moment to be here. I know. Isn't that crazy? We completely drilled it. Okay. <clears throat> it's up to our knees. It's up to our knees, boys. Here she comes. Here she comes, boys. And if I look down here, water is now spreading onto the floodplain. How cool is that? Epic. <laughs>